in a windswept valley near Ely, Nevada, behind imposing razor wire fences and under the constant gaze of heavily armed officers, several hundred of the West's most dangerous criminals are doing hard time. This is Nevada's maximum security prison, home to killers, rapists, gangsters, the condemned men of death row. And in the deepest, darkest hole of all is the most feared inmate in the state, Patrick McKenna, still wiry and muscular, but dwarfed by the massive corrections personnel who accompany him during any of the rare occasions when he gets out of his cell. You want to keep moving it, you can leave it alone. Just... McKenna scoffs at his fearsome legacy and downplays interest in his life. It's a mixture of, of this personal, this persona that's been created by the, some of the things I've done and some of the things the DA has fabricated, the prosecutors over the years. And uh, it's a combination of all that. A little truth, a little not so true. McKenna will never leave Ely alive. He's serving 16 sentences, including four life terms, a death sentence, and scores of tacked on years he will never live to see, the end result of a lifetime of bad decisions. He despises those cons who complain that they are the victims. I'm prepared to pay for the things that I've done. And I've given 38 years of my life so far to that uh, cause and been on under a sentence of death for over 20 years. I don't believe in a victim defense. I don't believe in whining about my situation or putting the blame on other people, be it uh, family members, uh, a counselor in a reform school who beat me. Maybe I fell down and hurt myself one day. So what? Life is a struggle. People go through life and they pick up wounds. They pick up scars. Some people are lucky and only get a few scratches. Other people are very unfortunate and don't make it. Or maybe they become paralyzed or something. I've been very fortunate. I've survived things that you wouldn't believe. Las Vegas in the 70s was a city struggling to find its way. Mafia families still secretly controlled several casinos and held sway with politicians and labor unions. Union violence wasn't uncommon. Strange days Well-connected mob figures controlled the street rackets and instilled fear even among lawmen, all at a time when corporations were moving into town in the belief that the casino industry and Las Vegas itself were becoming respectable. Even in such a turbulent period, young Pat McKenna already stood out with a well-earned reputation as a dangerous man. McKenna's first public splash came in 1964 when, at the age of 17, he and a friend abducted a young couple to a remote spot on Sunrise Mountain. The boy was beaten, the girl savagely raped. McKenna was sent away to do 20 years hard time. Shipped to Nevada's old, ominous maximum security prison in Carson City, it didn't take long for the teenage McKenna to make a name for himself. In 1966, he escaped from the state's toughest prison. I snuck out of a, in a garbage truck, but I sprained my ankle when the truck tipped over. You know, I damn near broke my ankle getting out. So you didn't get very far? No, not far at all. For the escape, he was sent to solitary confinement, the hole. He did six back-to-back -back stints in the hole, 29 days per stint, six months overall, nearly all of it in total darkness. While there, he had time to plan. And the day they put me upstairs for the one day in between 29 stretches, I escaped again. And, and uh, me and seven other, six other guys escaped that day, the very day they took me out of the hole. How many days? How we got all the way out. We got all the way out, you know, all past the fence. They were shooting at us. We were going under fire. As we climbed the fences, we were being shot at. Police dogs tracked down the cons, and McKenna was back inside. The following year, he somehow managed to cut through the bars of his cell, but it was noticed before he could bolt. In 1973, during a prison riot, McKenna acquired a knife and took a guard hostage. Again, his escape was thwarted. While inside, McKenna hooked up with a prison gang, the much-feared white supremacist Aryan Brotherhood. In a prison interview in the early 80s, he hinted about his affiliation. Prison, especially in maximum security prison, you're always going to have cliques, 
uh, violent episodes, prisoners against prisoners, the weak uh, getting vamped on by the strong. But how much is contained depends upon the type of administration. In my early uh, years, I was involved in prison gangs. Sometimes it's a matter of personal survival. Sometimes it's a matter of pure criminality. Back then, the prisons were different. They weren't constructed like this. They were big open yards, guys milling around, a lot of freedom inside the walls. All the administration cared about was don't escape, don't breach the walls. What went on inside the prison was our business. That makes for a situation of, uh, you have to control the situation. You have to control that to control your life, to make sure you not only survive, but while you're there, you're doing as good as you can. Despite his gang affiliation and the escapes, McKenna was paroled in 1976. Five days after being released, he went to carry out a murder contract and ended up raping the girlfriend of his target. His parole was revoked. And even then, when I was out, I was doing prison work. My head was in prison because when I got out of prison, I had things I had to do for the crew. There was money to collect, there was vengeance. I was an enforcer. There were things that needed to be done. In 1978, after serving out the remainder of his sentence, McKenna was released again, but wasn't out long. He dutifully carried out another gang contract, although his victim survived, and he was busted for assaulting two women in a Las Vegas motel. On the night he was convicted for the assaults, he was taken to a cell at the Las Vegas jail annex, the place where he would earn his greatest notoriety. The prisoners themselves have revolted up there. There were shots fired. There are two dead bodies in the jail. More on that when our story continues. to fight the situation. When you go to trial, it's not a matter of what took place or the truth. It's a matter of the prosecutor forming his lies and the defense forming their lies. So you have two sets of lies and nobody gives a damn about what really happened. Pat McKenna has had decades to form his opinion about the justice system with hundreds of court appearances as both a defendant and as his own defense attorney. Although police suspect that McKenna has killed at least four people, he's on death row for a single murder, one that occurred inside the Las Vegas City Jail Annex in 1979. I was in a bad mood, real bad mood. He had reason to be. On January 5, 1979, McKenna was convicted for sexually assaulting two women. He was returned to his cell at the then notorious jail annex at Las Vegas City Hall. He got into an argument with his cellmate. The cellmate was found dead the next morning. There are conflicting accounts about the reasons for the murder. Some say it was because cellmate J.J. Nobles would not perform a sex act on McKenna. Others say it was an argument over a chess game. McKenna has never been willing to tell his side of the story because he's never been willing to take the stand in any of his trials. Now, though, he's ready to talk. There was this little crew, four or five guys, that were wannabes. And when I gave them the cold shoulder and wouldn't have anything to do with them, uh, uh, animosity developed. They approached me wrong, and the one guy took a swing at me, and there was four of them. One of them had a shank, and the guy in front took a swing at me. When he swung at me, I sidestepped, put him in a chokehold, okay? I got him in a chokehold in front of the door, the cell door, which is about so wide, pushing his body against the cell door because the other guy's got the shank. His partner trying to get around, taking shots at around him, right? I'm using him as a shield for too long. I held him in the chokehold too long. I didn't know it at the time, but I think that's what killed him. In McKenna's eyes, it was self-defense, or at most, manslaughter, a fight between cons, not first-degree murder. But prosecutors went after him, and while awaiting trial for that incident, 
all hell broke loose at the city jail. A siege at the Las Vegas city jail that started Saturday morning when some prisoners overpowered a guard and used his gun to hold him and two other guards hostage. The August 1979 takeover of the jail annex made national news and helped to cement McKenna's perceived status as public enemy number one in Nevada. Two hardened cons, Felix Lorenzo and Eugene Shaw, both facing long prison terms, managed to overpower a corrections officer and gained access to gun lockers containing handguns and ammo. Two other officers were also taken hostage. Most of the 84 inmates were left in their cells, but McKenna says he oh, no. was invited Absolutely. to join the jailbreak and no. was given a gun. The plan was a quick breakout, right? That was the plan. That got fouled up because before we could get out within the first 15 minutes, uh, somebody spotted something was wrong and the alarm went off and we were caught. Then, from that, all escape was out of my head. From that point, it just became a question of surviving this thing and getting the hell out of here alive. Lorenzo, Shaw, and McKenna had hoped to walk out of the jail wearing the uniforms of their hostages, but an alarm was triggered and the jail was quickly surrounded. The area around City Hall was cordoned off and the siege of the jail began, attracting network news crews and an army of local media. Can you uh, give us an update? Yes, I, I was familiar with Pat McKenna. This is a much smaller town. Jerry Keller was a patrol sergeant and trained hostage negotiator. Years later, he would become Clark County Sheriff, but during the siege, he served as the principal spokesman for the police negotiating team. These three guys that had these three guns were committed career criminals that had, uh, you might say, nothing to lose. Uh, and we were in a tough spot. Keller and the hostage team made phone contact with the inmates to find out what they wanted. The initial conversations were with ringleader Felix Lorenzo, but eventually Pat McKenna became the inmate spokesman. After several hours of standoff, the inmates said they wanted a lawyer as an intermediary. Keller called in Stu Bell, a defense attorney who would later become DA and district right. judge. The, the police were not prepared to negotiate. They were going to do what they needed to do to bring this situation under control. The guards knew that their lives were in jeopardy. They certainly didn't want to lose any lives if they didn't need to but they were not letting these fellows out. The inmates decided they wanted to add another party to the negotiations, a news reporter. He had called the television station. Uh, he was watching Channel 8. KLAS news director Bob Stodall not only knew about Pat McKenna, he'd also known McKenna's father, a tough guy involved in local labor unions. Pat McKenna had first talked to Channel 8 reporter Paul Dawkins by phone, then changed his mind about a go-between. Okay, we have talked to the prisoners and they have requested Bob Stodall of Channel 8 to uh, receive their responses. As the hours dragged on, Stu Bell and Bob Stodall shuttled back and forth between the inmates and the second floor jail and the police negotiators below. Bob, is there What's the word? Anything? It's real quiet and things are moving, moving ahead. Stodall recalls the face-to-face -face meetings. McKenna is in the middle, um, and I believe Lorenzo was on the left and Shaw was on the right, and and Lorenzo and Shaw were kind of, they were nervous and, and, and ducking down where, where McKenna sat and kind of got his spot. And, and my focus was really on McKenna to kind of, and I saw the other two, but they're always bobbing and weaving. Um, but I stayed, my eyes were stayed right on McKenna. Uh, he, see, he was in charge, he had control. He told them to calm down, to take it easy. The cornered inmates seemed to be making up demands as they went along, a list of 18 at one point, many of them focused on poor conditions at the jail, and a few that were more grandiose. McKenna and his crew started by asking for a helicopter and money and some of these other things, and our instructions were just kind of play along with them and say, hey, I don't make the decisions, I gotta take it back to Keller, he'll tell you. But of course, we knew that the answer the next time we came back was no, there's no helicopter, and, then, then they'd move to a car or a bus or something less, and pretty soon at the end, they just didn't want to get shot. The snipers had a green light to take them out, take out the, the criminal negotiation side, McKenna, Lorenzo, or Shaw. At any time, there was a danger or threat to, to either one of those third-party negotiators. Police believe the inmates wanted the face-to-face -face negotiators because they hoped to grab them as additional hostages. In the early going, Felix Lorenzo had vowed to kill the hostage officers and dump them down the elevator. McKenna, for one, says he wanted things to cool down. And then across the street was a sniper with a red dot on my forehead. 
yeah, while we talked, you know. Um, but I told him much the same. We're just trying to get out of this thing alive, you know. But that, by that time, the thing had deteriorated to a... Once this list is resolved, then if they have any more, we'll probably get those also. After 44 hours of tension, just as it appeared a peaceful end was in sight, guns inside the jail began blazing away. The ringleaders were shooting at each other. The black guy just went crazy and came around the corner and started shooting. When it was over, police found 18 spent cartridges. Coming up, why the situation went sour and how Pat McKenna became the person that he is. It makes him look like Hannibal Lecter out of the movies. second floor jail facility. What has happened is that the prisoners themselves have revolted up there against the leadership. We we're only a half a step away from getting the guns out. When things went bad, I was on the telephone with McKenna, and I was talking to him on the phone, and all of a sudden, like nine, ten shots went off on the phone. Everybody's froze for a second. After 44 hours, the siege of the Las Vegas jail ended in bloodshed. Confidential reports compiled afterward by Metro have analyzed what happened. Lorenzo began moving along this track. It's been Shaw, dissected and discussed, Shaw, but still there are conflicting accounts. Bob Stodall and Jerry Keller were on the phone with Pat McKenna and were very close to having the hostages released when co-ringleader Gene Shaw started blazing away. McKenna gave this explanation when it was all over. The black guy was on the phone. He was talking to somebody. He came around the corner. Him and Felix got in a gunfight. They started shooting at each other. The black guy just went crazy. He came around the corner and started shooting. McKenna suspects that police cut a secret side deal with Shaw, asking him to disarm McKenna and Felix Lorenzo. If he disarms me and the other guy, that they'll cut him slack on his case. So he come around the corner shooting at us. You know, and all hell broke loose. Police say Shaw was worried that Lorenzo might execute the hostages, and that's what set him off. Jerry Keller thinks the cons mistakenly believed the cops were breaking in. The compressor of a water cooler on a wall on the other side of the jail clattered as those old compressors did. And uh, the three hostage takers, um, Shaw, Lorenzo, and McKenna, were sure that that was a SWAT team trying to burrow through. Got into an argument, a gunfight ensued. In all, 18 shots were fired, most by Lorenzo and Shaw in a running gun battle, although it's believed McKenna fired at least two shots. In the end, Shaw and Lorenzo were both dead. One of the hostages was wounded in the hand, and McKenna was hauled out of the jail naked but alive. The televised imagery seemed to confirm his status as Nevada's most dangerous criminal. I mean, these were not people in jail for petty larceny. These were bad, bad actors, and I don't want to promote Patrick McKenna's reputation yeah. inside the prison system, but but uh, he was a bad actor, so was Lorenzo, and so was, was Willie Shaw. I remember seeing him naked on the news when they hauled him out naked, yeah. Ken McKenna is Patrick's younger brother, but has also been his defense attorney. In fact, his first case, fresh out of law school, was to defend his brother for the murder of cellmate J.J. Nobles. And Pat grabbed J.J. and started choking him. Before the Nobles case came to trial, prosecutors first tried to nail McKenna for the murder of Eugene Shaw during the jail siege. Two slugs from McKenna's gun were found in Shaw's body. McKenna faced a laundry list of charges from the jail takeover. Murder, the kidnapping of the guards, and numerous counts related to the attempted escape. Acting as his own co-counsel, McKenna beat the murder rap when medical evidence proved that Felix Lorenzo fired the shots that killed Shaw. The kidnapping charges didn't stick either, but McKenna pled guilty to escape and was sentenced to 92 additional years on top of the three life terms he was already serving. One month later, he was tried for the cellmate murder. We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Patrick Charles McKenna, guilty of murder in the first degree. As with all of his other trials, McKenna was kept off the stand, unable to tell his version of what happened. But it wasn't the crime itself that put me on death row. It was the things, the other things, like the jailhouse thing. That's what's got me on death row. Not that particular crime. That particular crime is not a death penalty crime. I don't care how you hook it up. It was a fight in, between two felons, at most, manslaughter, at most. He's in that situation where he can never testify. Now, you say, well, what do you mean, Ken? Pat, and there's others like him, 
who are in the criminal system, they can't testify because even if they tell their side of the story and even if the jury believes it and it seems believable and you look them in the eye and it seems sincere, the district attorney is going to stand up and say, when you were 16, you committed this crime. When you were 17, you were convicted of this. When you were 18, you were convicted of this. So no lawyer can ever put Pat on the witness stand to tell his side of the story. It's never been told. Also never told was the larger story. How did Pat McKenna become this arch criminal and monster? Why did he end up on death row while his brother became a successful lawyer? McKenna's family has always wanted to tell the story in his defense, but Patrick would never allow it. To him, the story sounds like whining. I so I had a few tough times when I was like, who has it? Well, There's been people, there are people eating out of garbage cans, little kids. Today, they're having a tough time, you know, so they automatically get to grow up to be a criminal? I don't think so. It's a matter of character. It's a matter of character, and it's a matter of right and wrong. When I was younger, I had opportunities not to be a criminal. I made a conscious choice. McKenna's choices were limited as a youngster, and things happened to him that couldn't help but affect his development. His father was a tough customer involved in union organizing, a violent alcoholic who routinely beat up Patrick's mother. And there was constant abuse uh, in our house. Uh, there was, it was insanity. Although the excuse of abuse may seem overwrought these days, Ken McKenna says it was an everyday reality in the McKenna household. Pat was a bright kid who became bored with school, got into minor trouble, truancy and such, beginning at age 11. At 13, Pat McKenna tried to stand up to his father and protect his mother. His father beat him to a pulp. Mrs. McKenna heard about a new program, the Spring Mountain Youth Camp, a place where wayward boys could get back on track. It was a godsend. This camp had just been created. It was everything. It was beautiful. It was the place that Pat could be sent. He could get away from this violent environment. He would have caring, loving people. He would get his education, and he would have a chance to change his life. The reality of that camp was it was run by pedophiles and sadists who physically, emotionally, and sexually, we assume, abused those teenage children under their care. They would handcuff 13-year-old boys to the flagpole naked overnight in the mountains where it could get below freezing. Naked. Why? They used to make you fight your friends for their entertainment. The counselors would come in. We call it the Saturday night fights. There was no education, there was no school. All they did was give you a pick and a shovel, and make you chop weeds and build a road all day. That's what we did. And then, and then you whip your ass. Anytime you get out of line, they just beat you, slap you down. Now you gotta realize we're talking 10, 11, 12 year old kids, and these are grown men, these so-called counselors. And after about eight months of that, uh, when they let me out, I was, uh, I was a little bitter about the situation and very resentful of authority because my, my concept of authority was, was those bastards. And I hated them with all everything, everything I had in me. I hate them today. My memories of, of after he got back from Spring Mountain, he was totally disconnected. And there was a Pat that was my brother uh, that we spent time together and we knew each other. He was gone. Ken and the other McKenna boys didn't go through what Patrick did. Only the oldest son was beaten and sent away. McKenna's father eventually died of a gunshot wound, self-inflicted, lawmen said, although some suspected it was a union-related murder. The death came too late, though, to detour Patrick from his seemingly inexorable path toward death row. There's no question he's a killer. Coming up, McKenna gets the Hannibal Lecter treatment in court, and he nearly escapes from death row itself. Yeah, I'm a criminal or I was a criminal, big time. Yeah, and I've done 38 years. I mean, I want you, you know, 
can you just off the top of your head think of anybody that you, any criminal that you know that's done 38 years in prison? Just off the top. You remember the guy that Jagger Hoover captured down in New Orleans, a guy named Creepy Carpus back in the 30s? Alvin Carpus, yeah. He did 30 years. 30. I got eight over him. This guy was a multiple killer. You know, we're talking John Dillinger era. This guy was a multiple killer. He did 30 years. I've seen, like I said, killers come and go. I've seen people that don't deserve to be alive come and go. Child killers, people that kill children, people that do things that are just unspeakable, come and go. I don't like it, you know, but I've put in my time. So anybody that's got a beef with me or thinks that, hey, this guy needs to be executed, anybody who may be watching, shoot your best shot. It's no exaggeration to call Patrick McKenna the emperor of death row. He spends 23 hours a day in isolation, but still commands respect from both inmates and corrections officers, in part because of his seniority on the row and in part because of his reputation as a dangerous hombre. The sheer enormity of his collective sentences makes him stand out, even among the hardened company at Ely State Prison. I've been in corrections almost 29 years, and... and there might have been a few over the years, but I can't, you know, specifically call to mind any inmate that has 16 different sentences and, you know, four of those are life sentences and one of them's a death penalty case. Warden McDaniel declines to characterize McKenna as his most dangerous inmate. He says they're all dangerous if you allow them to be. The Ely facility is a tight ship that doesn't allow for a lot of interaction among cons, something especially true for McKenna, who's cleaned up his act over the past several years. In his earlier uh, career as a criminal, I guess, in the, in the system, had a lot of uh, what we call write-ups or disciplinary infractions within the facility. Um, they've kind of went up and down over the years. He's, um, in the last few years, he's slowed down a lot, and uh, he's uh, probably being uh, a little bit more, watched a little bit more carefully in the last, you know, several years. And... Uh, doesn't really have the opportunity to do some of the things that uh, he, he did in the past. For all of the crimes on McKenna's record, the escapes are what have earned him the most notoriety. Twice he slipped out of the maximum security facility at Carson City. Two more times he came close. After the infamous jail siege and his murder conviction, McKenna was returned to Carson City. Somehow he acquired a pistol and kept it hidden behind a shower wall for a year. In 1981, he used the gun to take nine guards hostage in yet another breakout attempt. He surrendered when prison officials refused to negotiate, commenting that he just wanted to give it a shot. You know, he, he gets a little smile when you talk about his escapes. He gets a little smile on his face. He recognizes he's not doing a good thing, but he, he, there's a, it's a point of pride for him almost, isn't it? You know, Pat's extremely intelligent, and having gone another way, uh, he could have been whatever he wanted to be. So I suppose in his world that he's in, um, sure, he, he probably does take pride in the success, the accomplishment uh, of an escape. I, I can completely understand that. When I was a youngster, I used to think about it a lot. And I used to put it into practice. And I used to do it. Later, it became more of an academic thing. Back then, I used to put things into action. I used to form an escape plan and then I would put it in action see if it worked, you know. And sometimes it did and sometimes it didn't. But a lot of it was that. And when I was younger, I generally wanted to get the hell out, you know, and, and uh, do things, you know. The crown jewel in McKenna's career as an escape artist came here at the maximum security prison near Ely in the early 1990s when McKenna and another group of inmates came this close to busting out of death row. The Ely prison was opened to be a new escape-proof facility built to house the worst of the worst. When McKenna transferred here in 1989, construction work was still underway. This reporter was in negotiations with McKenna and prison officials to arrange a death row interview. McKenna turned us down flat. I'm suspicious of the media in general. You know, I don't blame you. Because of personal experience with them, usually they work with the prosecutors. 
The reason McKenna didn't want any attention from a reporter is that he had hatched another escape plan and was nearly ready to go. As part of the elaborate scheme, McKenna and five other death row denizens had used hair clippings and assorted scraps to create paper mache heads to help cover their absences. They used ropes made from bed sheets to access a crawl space above their cells, labored inside the crawl space to dig a hole through the cell block wall, and somehow obtained wire cutters that could have sliced through the only fence that stood between them and freedom. They were awaiting the first storm of winter to go, but were ratted out by an inmate. Otherwise, McKenna says, he was gone. Prison officials insisted afterward the plot would never have succeeded. Like this place, I'm convinced in my head that I beat this place, this prison. These guys might not agree, but in my head, I think I beat this place. I did everything that was physically possible to do in order to get out of here. But it wasn't put into effect. And it was caught, I was caught before then. And I freely owned up to it. I took responsibility for it. And I'm still paying for it. You know, I'm still uh, on the special classification 10 years later, 11 years later. And you say that in your head you got out of here. That was in 1991 just before I retired. Prison officials note that no one has successfully escaped from Ely, and since Warden McDaniel has been running the place, no one has even tried, not even McKenna. He doesn't leave his cell unless two officers are uh, escorting him, and he's been searched and properly restrained, and, and there's no one else out in the area that he could come in contact with. In other words, Pat McKenna isn't getting out of Ely State Prison? No. The McKennas believe it's the escapes, not the cellmate murder, that has kept Patrick on death row for so many years. There's no doubt. Explain that to me. Well, it's a combination. I have a long history with the state of Nevada. People that were lawyers became judges. Judges became politicians, governors, senators. I, I had a prosecutor once named Robert List. You ever hear of him? Yeah, sure. Judge, how about Michael Fondi? Yeah. All these people are judges, ex-governors, or sit on the Supreme Court today. Mike Callahan, Robert List, Paul Laxall, Harry Reid, our senator, on and on and on. All these people I've had personal things with over the years as I've come up through this system, okay? You take that, and then you take the fact that I've done things against the system, like my takeover of the jail, my successful and not too successful escapes, the, the embarrassment it may cause certain officials, right? You take all that stuff into consideration, and you're going to have a lot of animosity between me and the state of Nevada in general. And I piss them off. I make them mad time to time. Pat's theory is that these escapes uh, serve as an embarrassment to the system, and that's why they want to put them away. What do you think about that? I think that's absolutely true. You know, Pat, in many levels, is an embarrassment to the system. There's also a lot of guilt. Uh, regarding Pat, and there are people uh, who do know uh, that what happened to Pat uh, at Spring Mountain and other places and the way the system handled his particular problems, which weren't serious initially, uh, that they are guilty. Ken McKenna knows that blaming it on the system will likely elicit groans from the public, but if ever there was a case where it's true, his brother would seem to be it. After the abuse at home and the brutality of the Spring Mountain Camp, young Patrick was sent away to a juvenile camp near Elko for committing petty crimes. He says he was bitter, not open to any help, and when he was released, he rejoined his young crew on the streets of Las Vegas. Now we're all older. We're teenagers now. We're dealing more serious things. We're pulling robbers. We're, we're getting involved in things that uh, we're doing we're doing peace work for the for the adults doing jobs for adults yeah, i'm not mentioning names or anything but it involved unions and all that mckenna won't so confirm it but law enforcement sources say his teenage crime crew was linked for a time to a notorious father and son hitman team tom and gramby hanley hired muscle who masterminded a rash of union-funded firebombings in Las Vegas and who were suspected of several murders for hire on behalf of mafia figures and labor leaders. The Hanleys were eventually sentenced to life for a mob-tainted hit on a union boss. Still only 16 years old, McKenna took a final stab at a straight life. His girlfriend became pregnant, so he married her, got a regular job, 
and had a plan to join the Marines when he turned 17. The dream didn't last long. The baby died, the baby girl. And I didn't handle that real well. I was kind of putting all my hopes on this, this family, then the Marines, right? That's where all my hopes and every rationalization I had for getting out of the criminal lifestyle was on that. When that didn't happen and the child and I started drinking, went back to the lifestyle. And in about four months, I was in prison. And then it's a downward spiral. And I've been in prison. That was 38 years ago. And I've been right here ever since. McKenna has committed terrible crimes, but in his view, he's never hurt a truly innocent person, only those already caught up in the criminal lifestyle. In a letter, he told us, each and every crime I've committed, without exception, has been against people in my world, in the life. I've never committed a crime against someone who wasn't in some way in the justice system or the criminal world. The Sunrise Mountain kidnap and assault is what first sent him to prison. McKenna says the teenagers he attacked were street gang members who had given information to police about his crew. The cellmate he killed had a long rap sheet and he says was trying to kill him. He notes he never harmed the hostages during the jail takeover or during any of his attempted escapes and various co-conspirators have testified that McKenna was adamant about not hurting anyone. The people he attacked during his brief periods of parole were all criminals, he said drug dealers and others who were in debt to McKenna's gang associates still on the inside. It's not an excuse, McKenna says in his letter, just an explanation. I'm not a serial killer. I'm not, I'm not out there on the streets stalking people and killing people for my own perverse pleasure. I'm not doing that. I'm not blowing up buildings full of innocent people. I'm not blowing up airplanes. I thought that that's why we had death penalty, for those kind of crimes. But lately, recently, the last week or two, it's been brought to my attention that the death penalty is to prevent a man from escaping from prison. You don't have to uh, be a child killer or a mass murderer or a serial killer. You've got to be an embarrassment to the state. Mr. McKenna does not get to choose. Coming up, the state tries once again to send McKenna to the death chamber. But a new attorney has a new issue to raise. It's just a technicality. Well, no, it's actually unconstitutional process. And if we give up that, you and I and everyone else lose. This is the room where prosecutors hope Patrick McKenna meets his end, Nevada's death chamber, where convicted killers are strapped down and injected with a lethal cocktail. For 24 years, a small army of lawmen and lawyers have tried to arrange McKenna's rendezvous with the executioner. And while McKenna was convicted for the slaying of his cellmate in 1979, he has twice had his death sentence reversed, once by the U.S. Supreme Court. But I'm not going to allow the state of Nevada to make me afraid or to make me think that they, because they say they're gonna kill me, I should worry about that. To hell with them. Bring it on. If they wanna do it, do it. But I don't think they can. You know, Pat has won every appeal he's ever had. That's why he hasn't been executed. Why does he win them? Because they make mistakes. Well, they're not just casual mistakes. They're errors in the process of justice. They shouldn't make those mistakes. Why do they make them? Because they don't care. They want the conviction. Opening statements began today in the penalty trial of Patrick McKenna. Of all Patrick today, McKenna's court appearances, the most surreal was the last, the 1996 sentencing retrial, his third for the same murder. Security was unprecedented. The courthouse was surrounded by officers, dogs, and a helicopter. Inside, SWAT officers checked the courtroom, then stayed for the proceedings, armed to the teeth. 
Everyone who entered the building had to be screened twice, and McKenna was transported to the trial in a wheelchair, with blinders on his eyes, mitts on his hand, two sets of chains, and a 50,000-volt stun belt around his waist. The measures were taken not only because of McKenna's prowess as an escape artist, but also because of rumored threats issued by the Aryan Brotherhood, McKenna's one-time prison associates. That security was there for a reason. I'm not at liberty to discuss all of those reasons, but I can tell you that he was uh, safely transported from the Nevada State Prison to the Clark County Jail, into court, back to jail, and back to prison. He didn't escape, and no civil rights were violated, and that's the mission accomplished for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. McKenna thinks lawmen got some bad information, perhaps from a prison informant. He says he long ago gave up any affiliation with the Aryan gang, and that in solitary, he couldn't associate even if he wanted to. I'm retired. I'm not a member of anything. His family and lawyers see more sinister motives. And having all that security sitting around with machine guns on their laps under their little cloths and looking like uh, it's an armed siege, of course that affects the jury. It's intended to affect the jury. When they roll him down the hall in a, in a chair with a mask on that makes him look like Hannibal Lecter out of the movies and that shows up on the newspaper, of course that's intended to affect people. The, the prosecutor, I think, is going to attempt to use shotgun tactics in this hearing and just, you know, fill the courtroom with things that I may have done, people said I had done. If I were to tell you that this woman testified about being brutally raped and sodomized and beaten with beer bottles and kicked in the face and beaten with rocks and threatened with firecrackers and beaten with a stick with nails in it, wouldn't you agree that that offender needed to go to a maximum security prison? Patrick told me to take my clothes off and that he was going to have sex with me. Um, and if I tried anything, that he would kill me. And he killed or badly injured somebody else. There would be no one on this earth more conscience-stricken than that family. The lead prosecutor in the 96 hearing was Dan Seaton, a longtime nemesis of McKenna's and one of the toughest prosecutors in Las Vegas history. Seaton relentlessly recited McKenna's life of crime for the jury, a kitchen sink assault. The DA's office believed then as now that McKenna's overall record warranted the death penalty. He was in custody and killed another inmate. If there is a poster child for the death penalty, that's it. I mean, if we can give somebody life without and they still are a threat to other inmates or guards or nurses that work, uh, I mean, life without then becomes, uh, becomes still a dangerous sentence. The proceedings marked a first for McKenna. He still wouldn't take the stand to explain his version of the jailhouse slaying, but this time he reluctantly allowed the jury to hear the story of his life as outlined by members of his family. The defense portrayed McKenna as a product of his environment, a creation of his own father. Put a belt, put his fist uh, with any object that was close by. You know, today, he wouldn't have got away with this. He'd have been stopped earlier. And Pat wouldn't be where Pat is. McKenna said afterward that okaying the painful testimony from his family was among the toughest things he'd ever done. Public defenders Pete Laporta and Nancy Lemke unloaded their own emotional onslaught as they pleaded for McKenna's life. Patrick Charles McKenna will die in Ely State Prison. He will leave Ely State Prison in a pine box. That is what we do know. The question is, will God decide when or will you? Even though he didn't testify, McKenna was allowed to address the jury and to do something he'd never done before. I'm going to do it now, and I'm not going to be phony about it. I'm going to talk to you honestly, and I'm going to talk to you frankly, and I'm going to talk to you straight from the shoulder. Please do not let them execute me. They're doing it for the wrong reasons. They're using me as, a, as an example. Think about it. That's all I'm asking. Think about it. Don't be overwhelmed by the propaganda and the, the smoke screens. And I ask you straight, straightforward, honestly, not to execute me. And listen, I, I, I know this has been awkward for me and probably for you, and I thank you for your patience. Thank you. You want to live? 
whose choice is it? Mine or the state? Is it my choice? Yes, I want to live. I want out of prison today. I want to live in a condominium in South Beach, Miami. This is what I want. I can't have these things. But it's not my choice whether I live or die. For the first time, a jury found there were mitigating circumstances in McKenna's crime. They were moved by the story of his life. But in the end, the verdict was the same. This is the third time a jury has ruled McKenna should die for a 1979 killing. In these boxes are the sum total of Pat McKenna's life in the legal system. Court documents, affidavits, police reports. It now falls to defense attorney Patricia Erickson to sift through the mass of paper to figure out if McKenna might win yet another appeal of his death sentence. He has had really horrendous things occur in his cases. I mean, the Ninth Circuit does not reverse capital cases on something that's not important. Officially, Erickson's pending appeal is limited to what happened during the 96 hearings, but she intends to examine the entire record of the cellmate murder case. More pointedly, Erickson says the security at the 96 hearing was over the top and will be an issue. The entire argument was this man is a danger to society. He'll kill her, he'll escape, he'll kill again. Um, you know, you have, I never was inside, so I can't say, but my understanding was that there were SWAT, you know, armed SWAT members and that there, I mean, there's certainly the security at the, in the gate, you know, going through the front door, um, that, you know, that the kind of security is, is un, you know, unprecedented. And anybody that's ever been in the courthouse would know that. I mean, all those jurors who are being asked to decide whether Patrick McKenna should die for his prior crimes and this crime itself had to feel the immense, you know, the, the, the incredible, you know, you don't have that kind of security unless that person is really, really dangerous. Erickson notes that while McKenna has been in prison for decades, there's never been a psychological evaluation of him to determine what shaped his psyche or whether he feels remorse. She asks whether society in general bears any responsibility. He started in our prison system at 11. We put him in, you know, horrendous situations from his early childhood on. I mean, he is a product of our prison system, and we need to take responsibility for that. Not even his family would argue that Pat McKenna is an innocent victim, but some whose lives have intersected with his wonder if death is the appropriate remedy. This is not an issue of sympathy for Pat McKenna, but clearly this is somebody who from almost from day one really didn't have much of a chance. I don't want to say he was predestined, but everything just was in order for him to be in trouble all of his life. Death? I, I, don't, I don't think so. He has done bad things, uh, but it's not all because of who he is. It's because of how uh, he uh, was treated. And the bottom line is, um, when it comes to his death penalty sentence, it's unnecessary. It's not necessary to execute Pat McKenna. Since then, 1961, there has been no executions in the state of Nevada that have not been voluntary. You know, legal suicide. Every execution has been a guy just giving up and legally committing suicide. There's never been. Now, why is that? Because the state of Nevada has such a, a fouled up legal structure in order to get the death penalty that convictions never hold up. They're overturned, they're vacated, or you drag them through the court for 20 years. All they have to do to stop all that is to give you a fair trial in the beginning.